Good afternoon. Open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Ruth, chapter 2, and we will read the first 12 verses of Ruth, chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? The servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, except that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath been fully shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. In this series of Ruth, if you've noticed, I've chosen as sermon titles a single word that would be the main theme of the sections that we are considering. So. So far, we have considered beginnings, demarcation, entreaty, return, and last week, providence. And today, we're going to look at grace. <coughs> grace. And certainly, grace is a very exhaustive theme. Grace. Uh, Puritans wrote entire treatises on grace. Grace is a very all-encompassing theme. And as we understand it, even just a little bit, it's a theme and a reality in the life of the believer that not only thrills our soul, but glorifies God as we trace the stream back to the source. Last week, we looked at providence the providence of God. And very briefly, we looked, looked at the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God, we said, simply, God rules all things all the time. And then we looked at providence and said, providence is the means by which then God brings to pass, brings about his eternal purpose or his decree. It's the process where he carries out his sovereign rule in our life. We looked at the fact that God is free to use means. He's free to 
work without means. He's free to work above means. He's free to work against means. God is able to work because he is sovereign and he will bring about his most holy will. His decree will be worked out. And again, we saw, as we'll see today with grace, thinking about providence is, is an infinite thought to see how God from before eternity set in motion and has, over the course of time and history, worked out in the lives of his people, worked out even in the universe, his perfect will. And it should give to us that extra measure of faith and assurance. Nothing happens by chance. Amen. When we read that Ruth's hap was to happen on a part of the field that belonged to specifically Boaz, that was not chance. That was not luck. God determined that she would go there. In fact, God determined through the whole course of this whole story to bring her back from the land of Moab to rescue her into his grace. We said that divine providence governs all things. We said divine providence is often misunderstood. We said the timing of his providence is perfect. He is never, ever late. Sometimes we think he's late, but he's never late. He brings us to the end often to ourselves so that we will trust explicitly and implicitly in him. So today we're going to look at the idea of grace. Grace defined. We'll look at sufficient grace in the life of Boaz. Manifested grace in the life of Ruth. And then the grace of grace in the life of Ruth. First of all, grace defined. What is grace? Well, both the Hebrew word and the Greek word that are translated into our English word grace, if we wanted to simplify it, simply means unmerited favor or undeserved favor. And it carries with it the idea of pity and of mercy. God uses grace both literally, figuratively, spiritually. He uses it in the abstract. He uses it in the concrete way. It's God's influence upon your life if you are a believer in him. Now, when we think of grace, we normally, or at least initially, think of grace that is imparted in salvation. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ by grace, you are saved. Unmerited, unworked for, undeserved grace is what brought you into the household of faith if you are a child of God this afternoon. You were born in sin, guilty before a thrice holy God, breaking God's holy law, an enemy of God, an enemy of righteousness, unrighteous, unable to justify yourself, unable to work for anything that would merit something in God's sight, spiritually destitute, spiritually dead, guilty as an unclean, as a, as, as a, as a un, undeserved, of anything graced, only deserving of eternal punishment and separa separation from God. But then grace came. Unmerited favor, <coughs> undeserved favor, mercy and pity. The gospel of grace came to you and saved you. Free grace, sovereign grace, the wonderful grace of God. Now regarding Ruth, we saw 
several weeks ago in verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1, we saw this, this profession of trust and faith in God. We saw seven New Testament gospel essentials that she mouthed back to God to Naomi. And in so doing, she verbalized her trust in God, her faith in God. She even, perhaps unknowingly, repeated back to God some of the God's covenant language that God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 6. She was saved when she came back to Bethlehem. Wonderful grace. But today I want to look at another aspect of grace because, as you know, grace does not stop at salvation. Grace does not stop when you are born again. God is gracious to you with grace every single day of your life. Grace is subjective and temporal, that grace that he gives to you every single day, that sustaining influence in your life that equips you, that edifies you, that is a source of joy that prompts you to worship, that moves you to prayer, that provides blessedness and comfort and communion. That grace that is manifested in your life in, in the marks of grace. Pastor Downing in his Baptist Confession says this, the ministry of divine grace in the life of the believer and in his experience is all-encompassing. It is comprehensive, electing, redeeming, calling, renewing, enabling, justifying, adopting, sanctifying, resurrecting, and glorifying the believer. And grace, like the believer, is seen in two aspects. Number one, objective and eternal, salvation. Salvation is objective and eternal, but secondly, and this is what I want to consider with you this afternoon, it is subjective and temporal. That is, God's grace is applied in our life every day, and it equips, it edifies, it works. Grace works in your life as it sanctifies, as it draws, as it gives comfort, as it I mean, grace has to be a reality in your life. Grace has to have this practical aspect in your life. And in the scriptures, this aspect of grace is seen in several places. Barnabas was sent by the church in Jerusalem to go to Antioch. And Barnabas, the scripture says, saw the grace of God in the church there, and he exhorted them to cleave unto the Lord, to have purpose of heart, and to walk with God. He saw the grace of God being worked out in the lives of the church. He saw the effects of grace. I mean, grace, you can't see grace, right? It's, it's invisible. But you can see the effects of grace. You can see the fruit of grace. You can see the reality of grace in your own life, in the lives of others. And so he said, he said, cleave unto the Lord. The same language that we read about Ruth, which he cleaved unto Naomi. Paul said the same thing. Paul, who warned the church with uh, tears night and day, he says, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, though that it will be build you up and give you an inheritance and sanctify you. I trust you are aware of this aspect of grace that is temporal, that is, it's just in this thing we call our lifetime. And it's subjective in the sense that you have a relationship to grace and someone else has a slightly different, depending on their life, where they are spiritually, grace being worked out in our lives, transforming us. This grace that is worked in, out in our life, this subjective 
part of it. As, as Barnabas said, cleave to Christ so that you will have this grace. We think of our Lord's words and we understand how it is developed when Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. The operation of grace transforms you by relationship. True life change flows out of a relationship from him to you. And this is where grace works. Grace working in your life. So grace is unmerited favor, undeserved favor. <clears throat> Not just in salvation, as tremendous and as wonderful as that is. But he giveth more grace. He graces you every single day. Opportunities for grace. He puts marks of grace in your life. These signposts along the way. He's a gracious God and continues to give grace. And we can see this grace in the scripture. Secondly, let's look at Boaz. And let's look at the sufficient grace in the life of Boaz. Now previously we have said Boaz is a type of Christ. He's a picture of Christ. <coughs> he, he's the mighty man of wealth who comes from Bethlehem. And he's the kinsman redeemer, the Goel. We briefly mentioned, we'll look at it later in chapter 3, but Leviticus 25 talks about the relative who can redeem, who can buy back a slave or land or property. And prior to Leviticus 25, the Goel... The kinsman redeemer is only applied to Jehovah God. Boaz performs many acts of mercy, many acts of benevolence. He enters into a covenant with a bride from the nations. We'll see later that Boaz is a type or picture of Christ. But today, let's consider Boaz the man and see how God's grace was sufficient for even him. Now, have you ever had anybody in your life where this, this person was so together that you thought, I would sure like to be a friend of his or a friend of hers. They're just a type of person that everybody wants to be a friend with. They have it together. They have this quiet charisma. They're genuine. They're helpful. They seem to have that sense of, of just security and know what to do in all these situations. Boaz, as a man, he wasn't perfect, obviously, but I think he was the type of guy that, that you would want to be friends with if you knew him today. I'm not going to give you references, but if you read through the book of Ruth, you will find out these things about Boaz, the man. Boaz has a God-centered and mutually respect, respectful relationship with his servants, his employees. He says to them, the Lord bless you. They reply, the Lord bless thee. Boaz takes notice of the poor, the reapers and the gleaners. He offers protection and provision and refreshment while the gleaning process is going on. His graciousness to Ruth is evident. Boaz acknowledges her vir virtue, even though she's a Moabitess. Boaz pronounces a benediction upon her. Boaz wants God's best for her. Boaz shows himself, King James' word uses the word friendly, to her. That's a word that means he speaks to her heart. In other words, he's genuine. He doesn't have a hidden agenda. He's not so insecure that he has to pump himself up with a hidden agenda. He's genuine to her. He provides for her beyond what she initially was promised because he delighted in mercy. Boaz goes with the threshers to work with them, even though he's the owner. He's the boss. 
He doesn't have to go work with the laborers. As a matter of fact, in chapter 3, he goes and he even sleeps at night on the threshing floor. He's threshing with the common laborers. Boaz uses terms of endearment to people, specifically to Ruth. He protects her, her honor. He displays an affectionate and a practical love to her. He's a man of principle. He will not do anything that violates God's law. And if there's some better case for Ruth, he will make sure that is what happens because he has this unconditional love for her. In chapter 4, the whole town thinks he's dignified and they respect him. He has this, this <clears throat> tremendous reputation. And as you know, he marries Ruth, the, the prince marrying the peasant girl. And men, scripture says he even is going to take care of his mother-in-law in chapter 4. This man, Boaz, is so respectful, so benevolent. He's got it all together. He's a nice guy. He's someone you would want as a friend. He's someone you would want to marry your daughter. He's this type of guy. And, of course, we attribute this all to the grace of God upon his life. He knew converting grace. He knew daily grace. He knew a sufficient grace. Boaz knew a sufficient grace that demonstrated the power of God in his life. The Bible says you should know a sufficient grace that demonstrates the power of God on your life. Now when I say sufficient grace, you know I'm thinking of that passage from the Apostle Paul who was given a thorn in the flesh, lest he should be exalted above measure. And you recall he besought the Lord three times that it might depart. And then the response was, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I will take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God said, my grace is sufficient. You will be satisfied with my grace. My grace is like a defense or a barrier or a wall that will keep out bad thoughts, questioning motives, all those things that will make this particular instance in your life untenable. My grace is sufficient. Sufficient grace in the life of Boaz. Now, I just read a complete long list of all the positive attributes in the life of Boaz. And you might wonder, what does Boaz know about reproaches or distresses or infirmities? I mean, he's got it all together. Boaz is the man. Boaz is the one who's going to take care of everybody. Boaz is this dignified, respectful person. Where is sufficient grace in his life? Well, you don't understand it until you read in chapter 4 that the father of Boaz was Salmon. And that doesn't make any sense to you unless you go to Matthew when you read another genealogy that says Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab. The father of Boaz was the city prostitute. The father of Boaz was a harlot. And Boaz rose above that very distressing, negative circumstance, not by pulling himself up by his bootstraps, but by the grace of God. Can you imagine the ridicule that Boaz probably underwent 
in his younger years, grade school, high school, all it takes is one loudmouth kid to, to spread the word, the reproaches, the persecution, all the outward stuff. What about the inward stuff? When he's alone with his thoughts, the questions, you know, why God? Maybe the denial, maybe to ignore it, to cover it up so he can avoid the pain. What a backstory to this Boaz who became a mighty man of wealth, who had this pedigree that we listed, who was such a man of principle and, and benevolent grace and love, such a man who's so exquisite and elegant that the Holy Spirit uses him, uses him as a type of Christ. But by the sufficient grace of God, his backstory became just that, a backstory. And what comes to the forefront is what God made him to be, a man of God. We all have backstories, do we not? Some are painful, some are embarrassing. Some have brought us to the end of ourselves. Some have left scars. Some, when they are known by people, we have to try to live them down. Sometimes our backstory has things that we've decided we will never, ever share with anyone. Sometimes they invade our lives, our thoughts, at, at strange intervals that remind us of their ugliness. And yet, if you are a child of God, like the Apostle Paul, you could say, His grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient. Oh, that the power of Christ would rest upon me. Paul said in another place, in a similar context, None of these things move me, neither do I count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of grace in me. Our backstories are supposed to be modified by his all-encompassing grace, his sufficient grace, even in the context of those problems. You see, God is not just saving us from eternal damnation, but he's saving us from sin, saving us from the effects of sin. And all of our backstories have sin involved, whether they're, it's by others who they've committed against us or affected us in some way. And God's sufficient grace is to enable us to rise above all of these. The operation of God's grace as we commit ourselves as unto a faithful creator, as we cast all of our care upon him because he careth for you, understanding that as we all behold with open face in a glass the glory of the Lord, we're taken from, we're changed from, changed into that image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. All sufficient grace. There's a, a radio program that I think started in the 50s, and it's a radio program that basically gives testimonies of individuals. And some of the ones I've heard, they're sensational stories. Problem with that, that radio program is, is 90 or 95 percent of the program is the backstory, and only 5 or 10 percent of it is, is what God has done and the, the miraculous change that has happened. Our backstories, I, I know they're real, I know they're hurtful, but our backstories are to be our backstory, and our front story is to be our new life in Christ. If the power of God's sufficient grace is resting upon you. By the way, last week when I was speaking about the providence of God, do you suppose the providence of God was involved with Boaz's backstory? Mm 
who better but Boaz to see a foreign woman who's despised, who's probably ridiculed and rejected. Boaz, who saw his mother, or perhaps his grandmother, Rahab, sometimes the genealogies in a scripture skip a generation or two, but, but who better than Boaz, who viewed Ruth, who better than Boaz to, to bestow grace upon her? Sometimes our backstories are there so we can minister to others. Mm -hmm. Is God's grace sufficient for you? And so everybody says, yes, of course, that's the right answer. But in your heart of hearts, when you're, you're up against the, the difficult life and death situations, when you're brought to the end of the red, edge of the Red Sea, and the enemy's behind you. When you're put into a, to a corner and you do not see an answer, is God's grace sufficient then? Yes, grace is invisible, but do you see the fruit in your life? Do you see the effect in your life? Is it known by you? <clears throat> do you know his sufficient grace the way Paul knew it? where Paul pressed God to erase it, to remove the trial. And in that case, God said, no, the trial is going to stay there. And yet in the midst of that trial, Paul, you will know my grace that is so sufficient, the power of the living Christ is going to rest upon you. And you're going to go through that trial in a way that's going to glorify me. Sufficient grace in the life of Boaz. Thirdly, manifested grace upon the life of Ruth. There was a manifestation of grace in Ruth's life. Simply stated, she saw it. She experienced it. She saw the reality of grace on her life. In the same way, you should see grace in your life. She asked Boaz, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldst take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? By way of application, she sees the reality of grace in her life. And Boaz gives her two reasons why she finds grace. Boaz sees her for the first time in verse 5. He asks the reapers, who is this damsel? They tell him, it's Ruth. Boaz has already heard of the report about Ruth. He says, oh, this is that Ruth? He immediately applies terms of endearment. He assures her of provision. He assures her of protection. He attaches her to his people. He tells her to drink from the water that others have drawn. All these aspects of grace. And she says, why have you graced me? So, so what was so attractive to Boaz about Ruth? Remember, Ruth is a gleaner. She's not wearing a Versace dress and carrying a Gucci handbag and has Chanel number no. five on. She's sweaty. She's probably got body odor. She's dirty. She's dusty. She's entirely clothed. She's working hard. She's got dirt under her fingernails. Why, Boaz, would I find grace in your sight? Boaz says, because it hath been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. In other words, you are a godly, virtuous woman. He sees the selflessness in her. He sees the, the grace and love in her, the virtue in her. <clears throat> 
That's what's attract, an attraction to him. The inner person of the heart. The, the essence of Ruth. That, that, that beautiful inner person. Not her outward. He sees her as virtuous. Interestingly enough, Ruth the Moabites is personified as a godly, the godly woman, the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. In Proverbs 31, remember the scripture says, let her own works praise her in the gates. Almost identical words in Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, all the gates of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Speaking about Ruth. It's not just me, Ruth that sees your virtue, such as me, everybody sees it because it's all pervasive. It's the real deal. Grace is manifested in her life in practical, real ways. She sees that she's graced by Boaz. Why have I found grace? Because he knew she was a virtuous woman. She was working for others, her mother-in-law. She was not seeking her own. And there's this attraction of grace in your life, dear friend. As God looks at you, and as God is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, and God wants to bring you to a certain spot, and along the way, he gives you these tokens of grace to encourage, to assure you of his love. Pastor always quotes that verse where he says, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love in that you minister to the saints. And you do minister. It's an ongoing activity. But secondly, he was gracing her because she was a believer. Not only did she help her mother-in-law, but the scripture says, Boaz says, but you've left your father and your mother and the land of your nativity, and you've come unto other people which thou knewest not heretofore. He goes on to say, you have trusted God, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. There's something attractive about grace. The world despises grace. The world despises a person who is living a holy life because it's a testimony against them. They hate it. But the people of God, and more importantly, God himself, sees a beauty in grace. Because grace is God-like. Grace is Christ-like. I asked our brother to read Psalm 45 because in Psalm 45 you see the king looking at his bride and he says things like he did in verse 11. The king greatly desires your beauty. It's the beauty of the grace of God in your life that is changing you. There is this attraction of grace. Grace manifested in the life of Ruth because she was a virtuous woman, because she was a believer. And Ruth knew she was grace. Husbands, does your wife know that you grace her? Does your wife know that you grace her every day with protection, with provision, with love? Does your wife know that you, like Boaz, care every day? There might be a physical attraction, but remember, Boaz saw what God was doing in her life, that she was serving, that she was unselfish, that she was going out of herself. Husbands, does your wife know that you are, take time for her? Boaz is taking lots of time for his wife. He's going to meet her emotional needs. He's going to help her. 
he's going to serve her. Why, because he gets something out of it? No, because she belongs to God. We should have that mindset as we think about our wives. But again, do you see the manifestation of grace in your life? Because God is gracious. Because, because God is doing a work in your life. The book of Ruth, in addition to redemption, in addition to providence, has this great theme of grace that just keeps popping up over and over on a daily basis. Because God is that kind of a gracious God. And we as his people should know that grace. Well, I think we'll stop there. We don't have time to consider our third point, the grace of grace, because grace works in our life. Grace is reciprocal to God because that's the definition of grace. That's what grace does. Grace doesn't hoard it. Grace multiplies it out. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that in the life of Ruth next week, Lord willing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for grace. Grace that has not only saved us from our sin, saved us from eternal judgment and damnation, but a grace that you bestow upon us every day. Oh, that we may never take that for granted. That we may never overlook it. But with humility, we would be thankful. With love, we would want to return that to you. Oh, that grace would take on that deeper, richer meaning in our lives. And we would not just sequester it to a theology textbook, but in that subjective way, in our life, in a very real and practical way. Might we see your grace in our life, and might it glorify thee. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.